Hey everybody, Norm from Tested here, and today I'm on location in the workshop of this guy, Matt, who is the owner of Small Change Arcade. Now, we have arcade machines around us, but these are a little different than the ones you might have seen or played with because these are your own builds, your refurbishing of classic machines. Tell me about the Small Change Arcade. Uh, so these are the, the real deal. These are actual uh, games with real boards and, um, and real CRTs. And um, it all started because I have a tiny apartment here in San Francisco, and I wanted to keep my hobby going of uh, arcade games, so I just started making these in my living room, and now I got a little bit bigger of a shop, but um, they're all handmade, and um, yeah, they're as close as I can as to the original thing as possible, and totally playable, and they take quarters and the whole thing. Oh, wow. In the world of arcades today, you can get a machine, an emulated machine, a right. digital machine that uses an LCD yep. and even uses controllers, very similar to ones you'd find in the old arcades, but you're not doing any of that. Yeah, like you, no exceptions. So You said boards. It must start with the boards. Yep. So here, for example, this is a Donkey Kong Jr. board up here, and um, that's the original board from 1982. Um, and they just barely fit um, in these cabinets. You can kind of see the width here. It fits right in the back. Um, and so, yeah, original board, and then the other really important piece is a CRT monitor. Yeah. Um, a, there's just um, there's a look that you get uh, when the kind of the pixels kind of just blend together a little bit more on a CRT and the scan lines and all that. But to me, the more important thing is the input lag that you get with an LCD, which with like these old games, um, that that's make or break. If yeah. You're, if you're yeah. trying to get the high score, especially on something like Donkey Kong, where yep. people play competitively. Mm -hmm and the feel of an old machine yep. with the board and the visuals and the controls, it all adds up yep. to that experience where you can notice if there's a little bit of difference yeah. in the play. And that's one of the things that I love about uh, classic arcade games is, even I mean, current games, they're designed to, to compensate for that input lag, but you're pressing a button on your controller, it's going across Bluetooth, there's an operating system, all these levels, and then something happens in the game, and then it shows up on the screen. And there's just a much more direct uh, experience of pressing a button, some electrons shoot through it, come out the screen, and it's as, it's as instant as it can get, which is interesting since it's just an old technology. Can we go around the back of these machines sure. to see how all the components fit yeah, in? Yeah, you want me to just spin it around? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, just real careful this board up here. So this is uh, about 40% the size of a full machine. I That's right. I assume you chose that so that it could fit in your home. Yeah. Uh, but also, there's only so much that you could get it smaller. Like the width of the board yep. th determine the size of this? Yep. That's one of the, the main, one of the main limiting factors is the size of the boards, which are, were pretty large back in the day. I even have some larger ones like Dig Dug, some of the old Atari games are like really big. Um, but yeah, they just barely fit. The games just barely fit. And then the other problem is getting the monitor, the CRT monitors to fit. One of the interesting thing about CRTs is as, as you scale up the CRTs, the depth doesn't get as much bigger as uh, is scaling in the other dimensions. Mm -hmm. And so when you scale them down, they still stay pretty deep. Right, right. And uh, so that's one of the problems that I have here. And you can see this Donkey Kong, which is finished over here, it has a 13-inch Wells Gardner monitor in it. And I had to uh, kind of refabricate this frame here to put an angle in it here so it wouldn't stick out like this one. Oh, so it here. was more like this, and you are literally bending the frame while yep. avoiding the board on the inside. Yep, and then I had to move, uh, you know, I have to move the chassis over so everything fits. And um, yeah, so that's always a big challenge. And then I just barely clears. Now, yeah. in terms of the fabrication, right, you, you can you can do woodworking, you can, you're, you're painting up the, the, the cabinet and building that up, but there's only so many of these boards left right. and so many of these CRTs left. Yep. What, is, what is the market like right now for finding parts? It's getting tougher. Um, everyone kind of wants them, and there's kind of this resurgence going on too right now with arcades and barcades and kind of mm -hmm. stuff happening. Although a lot of those places, they won't tell you, but there's not a real board in a lot of those games. But they are still, um, you know, they're, they're going pretty quick. And so a lot of times what I do is purchase broken boards. Um, a, I kind of just like to fix them anyways. It's a fun hobby, and I like to learn more about them anyways, and then also I can get them for a little bit cheaper. Um, so I try to start with broken boards and then and fix them. And then similarly with uh, the monitors, a lot of times you'll find um, just the chassis, which is the circuit board that attaches to the, the monitor, and maybe a frame. So I'll start with a frame and a chassis, and then I'll find a tube somewhere that I can use. So um, I'm dumpster diving, looking for, um, you know those old, uh, uh, 
13 inch TVs that would have the uh, VHS yeah, yeah, at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. Those, those are, are those will work. Those work great. <sighs> so those that's what those are up over there. And those fit with, uh, it depends on the chassis. You have to find, it has to have the right number of pins on the back. The impedance on the yoke has to be correct. And then you have to match it up with the, the, a corresponding chassis that'll work. But you do all that, put it all together, and you got a new monitor. When, when you're mixing and matching, are, are you learning things, or do you know things about how the machines were built so that things would be compatible like that? Or is there a difference between like American arcades or Japanese arcades, or what are the things that they consider? Um, with the with the monitors, yeah. Um, so the the main uh, issue with the monitor is the type of input signal that it accepts. So with uh, with arcade monitors, it was before like VGA was a thing. Um, remember, um, so if you use like you plug your Nintendo in, and you, or we used RCA for the longest time, mm -hmm. right? Which was the red, red white, white, and, yep, and yellow. yellow, and the yellow was the video. So it was just one wire, not one cable, one wire that had the entirety of the video signal on it, and which worked okay, and that's what we used for a long time. But for kind of more uh, industry stuff, they would, they would split that into red, green, and blue, and a sync signal. Mm. And so that's what arcade monitors use, is that RGB standard. And that was before they went to VGA, which was slightly different, but pretty similar. So the difficult thing is finding a monitor, particularly in the US where we didn't have consumer monitors that had that input, so you have to find, um, I use uh, Sony broadcast monitors. Sometimes they have the right inputs on the back with BNC connectors, uh, which work pretty well for some of my games. These games over here use a monitor from an Apple IIGS. An old like home computer? Yep. That still would have the right pin? It was this weird in-between time that they, hadn't, they were kind of in-between standards, and this one model of the Apple computer has the right monitor. Wow. So I'm always searching for those. And so, um, and yeah, that's about it, just making sure that the, they accept the right video signal, they're the right size proportionally for my game. So uh, the board and the game kind of uh, determine, the board and the monitor determine the overall proportions of the game so it looks right. So a little further into your shop, Matt, this machine caught my eye. It's beautiful. Uh, I also love the, the inlay work you yeah. did here. Tell me about your, your manufacturing process. So this one was really interesting. This is one of the, the most complex ones that I did from like an engineering design point of view. Um, there's a lot of things I had to consider with this one. Um, same thing, it's running a 13-inch Wells Gardner monitor that was a uh, tube swap from a, a TV. And now the interesting thing about this one is the only place for the board to, that would literally where it would fit is right here. And you can see it through the acrylic inlay here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so since that was the only place it could go, um, I always like to have a feature on my games where you can see in and see that it's the original board and not an emulator. And so that worked out great. That's where I wanted to put it. And I wanted to use this, um, this main graphic right here as uh, a cutout inlay and make that um, see-through. But the really interesting part here is that the corner of the monitor is right here. Oh. And so normally it would attach. Yeah. You'd have an anchor point right there, but I couldn't do that since yes, this is here. Acrylic. So I had to come up with this whole, there's like a, a caddy if you, that kind of holds, a frame that holds the monitor frame. And the whole thing has to be able to come out flush out the back because it can't come out this way because there's not enough room. So the whole thing has to be able to slide in there and then secure the, this frame that I built has to secure in enough places to hold the whole thing steady enough even though it's not attached right here. So that was really um, an interesting engineering problem. And then this, uh, this was all done by hand and then uh, this uh, was cut and the acrylic piece was cut by hand. You didn't use laser or no. anything for that? No, nope. I didn't even use a large format printer to cut the stencils that I used to hand paint this. So I, it was all exactoed by hand, a bunch of pieces of paper glued together, cut out. Oh my God. And then all the black uh, was done by hand. And then the big colors were, uh, were stencil. And I, I know that you take these arcades to other arcade places mm -hmm. so for people can play them. So they have to be pretty durable too. Mm -hmm. So you've made a bunch of these now. Like when you're fabricating now, they're, they're made to last? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, you know, they're built built better and with better quality than um, better quality materials than an actual arcade game. So I use really high quality um, plywood for the sides. 
and then all the internal uh, supports are just these other plywood pieces, but then everything is doweled together. And so what I do is I get one side, I have all my holes drilled out, and then I get all my dowels and my connectors, line everything up, like so, for example, one would go right here, like that, and get it all lined up, and then glue the whole thing in one, one go. Wood glue and clamp it yep, all together. Yep, and then so there's no screws or anything holding the actual uh, uh, cabinet together. So it's not going anywhere. It's, and, they're, and they're hefty too. So that adds to kind of the weight, which is nice because you don't want them rattling around mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. So they're, they're for sure built to last. And then I put them in the arcades and they have lasted. And so they're battle, battle tested in the arcade. You know, people, kids hanging on them and all sorts of stuff. Wow, and, and it looks beautiful, the aesthetic, the, the, the tea molding here, it just, it reads as an arcade. And for kids who want to play, it's a little more yeah, yeah. for their size. Yeah, it's, it's actually cool to see uh, kids playing them. That's one of, one of my favorite things, to see the younger generation enjoying them. Matt, you mentioned that you like to refurbish boards mm -hmm. too. So imagine before it even goes into the chassis, you're doing a lot of testing yep. and, and building. Is that what this setup is for? Yeah. So I've got a little uh, test station over here, and this is just a pretty simple, all this is is the parts of an arcade machine, but on a test bench here. So this little thing underneath here, what we have is there's a power supply right there. Um, there's a couple buttons. These are for like the start buttons and the service button. And then I can put a uh, board up on top here, which is nice so then I can get at it while I'm working on it. And this is a, a JAMA connector, which is like the standard uh, connector that they use for arcade games. Some games are different, so you can use like a converter mm -hmm. to plug in different games if you need to. Um, and then in the front here, I just made a couple ports um, and to plug a, uh, in this little, just little dinky controller that I made in an enclosure here. And then if I want to test player two, I can pop it into player two got it. and do that. And then, so yeah, and then it's just got a switch over here to test it. This uh, is a Neo Geo uh, board that's not working. Shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're at, at this point, you know, are you swapping out individual chips, mm -hmm. or how are you actually uh, yeah. doing the refurb? There's definitely, um, you know, I'm not. Um, I don't know if there is a school you can go to to learn how to repair arcade boards. I think it's more of a just um, through the grapevine kind mm -hmm. of community knowledge. based. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and I don't even really have a background in basic electronics, but I've always been into it, so I've, I've learned a, a number of things over the years. So there's kind of just a general um, uh, troubleshooting you can go through, like, A, does anything happen when you plug it in? Like, right. yes, no, that kind of gives you two buckets of things to try. If it is working, you know, you're getting power, something's happening, okay, then what next? Um, and depending on the board, there's a lot of things you can do. The first thing you can do is just a visual inspection. And actually, if you look at this board, if you look over here, you'll see a bunch of corrosion on this battery. Yeah. And all up in here and also on that little crystal in there. And I just know from experience that that's what, that's what this problem is, is the problem with this crystal right here. So what I would do for this board is it has a rechargeable battery on there. And uh, what I would do is replace it with uh, one of these guys. Right. And so get that one out of there, put a new uh, seat for this uh, that battery in there and then swap that out and then you don't have to worry about that anymore and then clean it up and fix a couple uh, components and then hopefully it'll work. Awesome. And there's all sorts of other things you can do. Testing, uh, if nothing's happening, you can test um, the voltage at different points of the board and kind of trace it back to where your problem is. Um, a lot of times it's a broken trace on the board and you can jumper that or fix the trace or do all sorts of things. But it's almost, they're almost always fixable. That's what's great about them. Is yeah. It's all whole through components very little surface mount stuff, uh, very little multi-level PCBs. So it's just you find the problem, you find where it's not connected, connect it, it usually works. Well, that's the great thing about those arcades back then. They weren't making for miniaturization, mm -hmm. which makes them easier <laughs> exactly. to access exactly. and to, to bring new life into them. And they look so awesome. I'm sure they yeah. draw a lot of crowds. And hopefully that gets a new generation of gamers and arcade players Absolutely. appreciating the classics. The way they were actually played exactly. back then. Matt, thank you so much for inviting us here. It's a pleasure. Where can people find out more information about your builds? Um, you can find me on Instagram at smallchangearcade or smallchangearcade.com. Um, contact me if you want to do a rental event. I, I bring them to your uh, event, and I'll set up a whole little mini arcade for you. Um, or uh, come to Free Gold Watch, and you can play my games uh, in the arcade. Awesome. In San Francisco? Yep. Awesome. Great to meet thank you. Thank you so much.